Hi, I'm Marcia. In the upcoming video, I'll tell you the story of why I moved to Spain. If you're enjoying these international living videos, please click like and subscribe to the channel. If you click on the little bell icon, we'll send you notifications of all the new episodes. And if you have a question for me, just write it in the comments section and I'll reply. Okay, see you soon. I'm Marcia Scarborough, International Living Spain correspondent. Let me tell you why I moved to Spain. In 2008, I lost everything in the housing crash. I was living in Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, selling real estate. And my retirement plan was that I had bought these two houses and fixed them up and was renting them out. And the idea was they would pay for themselves and then they would become my nest egg for my comfortable retirement. And in 2008, they went totally upside down, way upside down both houses and since i was selling real estate the sales dried up and i had no income the houses went into foreclosure i had put a lot of money on credit cards to fix them up uh, and again i had no income and uh, the interest rates went up on the credit cards and by 2010 i was bankrupt really i had nothing in fact i had less than nothing because i owed money to a friend i had a five-year-old car a five-year-old laptop and a fragment of an ira which had never been a big ira to begin with um it was really bad and at that moment even though it was my life was a total disaster i thought you know i have nothing but now I'm completely free. I have no responsibilities. Um, I was divorced. Um, I have no children. Um, I'm not close to my sisters. And then I had no real estate either. So I was 63 and with no hope of ever putting together a comfortable retirement plan. Um, I took my social security early. I was able to live in one of the houses while it was going through the foreclosure uh, process rent free. And I rented out some rooms in that house and that kept me afloat. Uh, during that time, I took a class to get a certificate to teach English to speakers of other languages. And I got a part-time summer job teaching English in an English immersion program in one of the universities in Santa Fe. And the students in that program were faculty from affiliated universities uh, in Central and South America, Mexico, and some European countries who needed to improve their English. So I was making a little bit of money at that, enjoying it, and making contacts with people who lived in other countries. I've always been a traveler. I'm well-traveled. In fact, I had lived in Mexico, in Ajijic at Lake Chapala for six months during the year 2000. And so I had the idea that I could have a good quality of life in another country on the money I had. So uh, during that period when I was teaching and living in the foreclosed upon house, uh, I had a second pension from my years in the movie business that kicked in. So by the time I had to move out of that house, I had a little over $2,000 a month as a passive income, which is not enough to live where I wanted to live in the United States. And so I knew I had to scout out another location to move to. Um, when I moved out of the house, I put everything in storage and I started traveling during the, the winter months to places where my former students lived, where I, I had some people, friends that I could have contact with, uh, most of which were in the Southern Hemisphere, which were warm during the winter, which was what I was looking for. So I would travel for three to six months, scouting places out, and then come back to Santa Fe, uh, rent a furnished short-term rental for uh, six months, do the summer teaching job, and then go off again. So I went to Chile and Argentina and 
Mexico and Brazil and Honduras and Guatemala and um, you know had a really good time traveling and being with friends. Uh, Mexico and Guatemala were really high on my list and then in 2016 one of my former students invited me to visit him in Madrid, Spain. He was someone who had become quite a good friend. He, he, originally he was my student and he did so well learning English that the next year he came back as a visiting professor. He was a fine arts professor at the same university and so we got to be quite good friends and did some traveling together and things while he was living in Santa Fe. And so now he was back in Madrid and I had never really considered Europe because I had a preconceived idea that it would be too expensive. I wouldn't be able to afford it. But I wanted to uh, visit Alberto and he was inviting me to Madrid. So I went to Madrid and I really, really liked it. So I went to Madrid to visit Alberto. And I had never been to Spain before and I really liked it a lot. Alberto had a really interesting life in Madrid. Madrid is really a fabulous city. He introduced me to his friends and then he took me to Sevilla to meet his parents and Sevilla is beautiful and he took me to the Alcazar, the old Moorish, Moorish fortress there, uh, which was gorgeous and we were sitting in the garden of the Alcazar in, on a spring afternoon and it was the perfect warm temperature and flowers were blooming and we were sitting in the shade and birds were singing and we were having coffee and I thought this feels good this feels like what I'm looking for and so that was the beginning of a journey from there Alberto went back to Madrid I went on to Granada by myself and I was walking around Granada the Albacin by myself and I thought, I wonder how much it costs to rent an apartment here. And I started looking at the, apart, the cost of apartments in the different places that I went. And I traveled around quite a bit. Barcelona, Cordova, um, Cadiz, some other places in Spain. All really beautiful. So another thing I did during that 2016 six-week scouting trip was I volunteered at an English immersion program. This was an eight-day program called Pueblo Inglés where an equal number of uh, Spanish students learning English and native English speakers go together to a resort and speak English for eight days. And then you also play games and have group discussions and do a little amateur theater and have fantastic meals and wine and for me it was super fun and I made friends with Spanish people. And in eight days, when you're having a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations, you make some pretty good friends. You get through superficial uh, topics quite quickly. Uh, so by the time I got back to Madrid, I had the friends I had made at Pueblo Inglés. I had Alberto and a couple of my other former students and some of Alberto's friends. So I had like 10 friends in Madrid. And I thought, with 10 friends, I could move here. So um, the other thing I noticed as I was traveling around Spain is that it was quite affordable. And I really could have a good quality of life there on the money that I had. And of course, the weather was fantastic. Uh, the food is great. The, the, the culture is really interesting. The wine is amazing. Uh, all those things. Uh, and then a couple other things that really impressed me about Spain and one was the infrastructure. So there's always hot water for a shower. You can drink the water from the tap. They pick up the trash every night. The roads are really good. There's electricity 24-7 and those are sort of first world luxuries that to me were very attractive uh, about life in Spain. Then. Another thing was that the safety. Spain is really safe. You can walk on the streets all any time of the day or night as a woman alone and not even think about it. Okay, there's a couple pickpockets, you know, don't put your wallet in your backpack, just like normal things, but there is almost no violent crime. 
and people are out walking around the streets late at night and it's it's completely safe people do not have guns to me that was a big plus I was very very comfortable there the other thing is Spain has its own schedule and for me it's great it's a perfect schedule for me because I have never been a morning person so uh, in Spain nobody stores don't open until 10 or so um, lunch is between two and four and it's the big meal of the day and maybe you have wine and maybe you take a siesta after dinner isn't until nine and then everybody stays up late socializing with their friends and sleeps in in the morning for me it's perfect now if you're an early to bed early to rise person you might not like that but I really do like it and the other thing was that there's a joie de vivre in Spain. People really enjoy life and they really value friendships. And it's very important to them to go out and socialize with friends and families. People are well-traveled. Uh, the people I met, especially in the English immersion and the Friends of Alberto were very well-educated. Uh, so there's quite a, a exuberance for life that I really, really liked. So by the time the six weeks were up and it was time for me to leave Spain, I was sad. I kind of didn't want to go. And I was thinking, I think I really could live here. I should figure out if I can do it. So on the way home, I, I flew from Madrid to Dallas, Fort Worth, where I had a seven hour layover before I got the plane to Santa Fe. And during that seven hour layover, I got the worst food poisoning I've ever had and I was so sick in the airport and on the plane going back to Santa Fe and for a couple of days afterwards um, and I took that as a sign that if the universe has ever sent me a sign that is a sign you were six weeks in Spain you were perfectly well and happy the minute you hit US soil you got sick so US is making you sick you need to move to Spain so I started to investigate how to do it, what the financial requirements were and the other requirements. And I just barely had enough money to do it. So I thought I better do it now because if they raise this financial requirement, I won't be able to do it. So uh, it took me about a year to get all the paperwork together. And there, was, there were some bumps along the way. And when I hit those, I reached out to those Spanish friends I had made at Pueblo Inglés. And they're used to dealing with bureaucratic catch-22s and they came through with some really good suggestions that solved the problems and I got the visa and when I found out that I had the visa uh, it was right around my 70th birthday like a, a couple days before or after my 70th birthday which was also a couple days before or after the Trump inauguration so I thought hmm I guess I had some kind of precognitive um, knowing about how this political situation was going to change in the US and I made the perfect choice. Now an interesting little sidebar here is at the time that I found out I got the visa I was visiting friends in LA uh, which and I, to, to get the visa, then you have to go back to the consulate where you submitted your paperwork and pick it up in person, which means I was going to have to fly to Houston to, to get the visa. So I had told all my friends in L.A. this. So one of my friends in L.A. went to a charity uh, event where she was seated at a table with people that she didn't know. And they were introducing themselves. And one of the men said, he was from Madrid and he was a correspondent on the daily newspaper, El Mundo. And she said, that's interesting because one of my friends is moving to Madrid. And he said, oh really? We'd be interested in talking to her because we've been wanting to do a story about Americans who are leaving the country because of Trump and moving to Spain and we haven't been able to find anyone. So she made the connection uh, and uh, he interviewed me as he drove me to the airport to fly to Houston to pick up my visa. That interview ended up being on the front page of El Mundo with colored photos and then was picked up 
by newspapers all over the Spanish-speaking world. And I was getting messages from my former students in, in Argentina, in Puerto Rico, in Mexico, all saying, you're on the front page of the newspaper in our country. Congratulations. So uh, by the time I went back to, um, to Santa Fe, packed up my stuff, and got ready to go to uh, move to Spain permanently, I'd been interviewed uh, for all kinds of different Spanish publications, television stations, for CNN in Espanol, like a lot of, um, a lot of attention. And so by the time I was ready to actually move to Spain, there were reporters wanting to meet me at the airport and interview me as I stepped off the plane, which I refused. That was like way too much. But I did arrive in, in Spain with a bit of notoriety, which uh, kind of served me well. So at this time when I got the visa and I moved to Spain, I had just turned 70. And as my 70th birthday was approaching, I was thinking of my mother because she died when she was 70. And I was thinking, I'm going to outlive her. And in honor of her, I should really make this last chapter, these years that I'm going to have that she didn't get to have, into a great adventure. And that's what my life in Spain has been. I've never been happier. I'm having so much fun. I have so many friends, young people who, are, who think I'm really interesting. My social life is on fire. I go dancing and we go out for wine and drinks. Then we go on picnics. It's, it's been a great adventure. And I don't think that that would have happened. I don't think I would have made this brilliant choice and had the courage to make the move if my comfortable little retirement plan had worked out. I think it was the absolute disaster at that low point of my life, bankrupt, foreclosed on, with nothing, that allowed me to close that door and open this door into a brilliant choice.